Good morning. My kid wearing Denver Bronco colors. He also asked earlier if he could go to sleep when we were in the pew. No, you can't go to sleep. It's church service. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 26. This, we, we pointed out a couple of months ago that this is the part of the story where the, the, the action is rising. We have this more excitement. And when Jesus, back in chapter 12, was disputing with the group of three and the group of two and the group of one, he seems to be winning and winning and winning and all this winning. And this rising action is um, cut short by this text that we're covering today. You, you would think that just any moment he's just going to go and he's going to sit on the throne and he's going to rule the world from there. But there's a betrayal and a death that's going to happen first. And so we're going to follow that. So Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. That's our text for today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for bringing us here this morning gathered together under your word, uh, gathered together by your spirit, uh, made right by your blood. Um, I pray that today that you would be drawing us together, drawing us to you. And today, as there are many who, who are in the community who are sick, I pray that you would be with those, that you would give them health and rest, comfort, and that we could see them again next week as we gather together. But today, as we look into your word, I pray that you would be glorified in it. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Just like the rest of the book of Mark, this section has one primary theme, and we talked about it last week, and it's this idea that this is God's plan. The terminology used is pointing out not, not happenstance or coincidence or bad timing or mistakes. This is the plan. As I pointed out last week, we see this theme. This week he sees the disciples are going to fall away, which is an answer to uh, Scripture. He tells Peter specifically, you are going to deny me. Right? Jesus then prays that the hour would pass from him, and we'll look at that further. That actually is talking about God's plan. He prays that the cup would be taken from him. 
That's another discussion of God's plan. Jesus then says, the hour has come. Right? Then, then he connects that to the, the coming of the betrayer. It's time to go. This is all God's plan. And of course, he sums it up by the statement, let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of the time that Jesus is dealing with this, he has that one thing in mind. We're going to do God's plan. Now, we had warnings last week. Right? We had warnings back in chapter 13. Warnings today. We have to understand the warnings, like you're all going to fall away, is not to keep them from falling away. They are going to fall away. The purpose of telling them that is so that they don't fall away forever and lose heart. When they fall away, they actually can see that as an answer to God's promises. And they actually gain encouragement from that. And so as odd as it sounds, them falling away results in their encouragement. In fact, the last thing that we see of Peter in, in it's going to be next week or the week after, is Peter denies Jesus. He rejects even knowing him. The next time we see Peter, he is running to the tomb. Because the day that he denied him, and here's the rooster crow, and he looks across the courtyard, and whose face does he see? Jesus' face. He is absolutely certain that he had done exactly what Jesus said he would do. And there was conviction there and there was remorse there. And the next time Peter has the opportunity to stand for Christ, he does. He's motivated by it. So uh, we have to understand these comments that Jesus is telling his disciples, you're all going to fall away, is not discouragement. It's also not to make sure that they don't fall away, it's to encourage them when they do fall away. That's the purpose of these warnings. That's a caring Savior. Knowing what's coming for him, he's looking at his disciples saying, you guys are going to walk away, but you're coming back. And it's going to be okay. He's caring for his disciples. So that's, that's, the, that's the first thing that we're looking at. This is God's ordained plan. The second thing we're going to look at is that Jesus is truly human. And this text, probably more than any other text in the Gospels, shows that Christ is a man. Which, the whole idea that God can become man is confusing and incomprehensible, but we see it play out here in this. And then, of course, based on that issue, we have the third, the third point. What is Jesus seeing coming his way? What's he so concerned about for himself that he would actually pray to God, change the plan? It, it begs the question, what's he so worried about? So we see God's plan, we see Christ's humanity, and then we, we see the, the, the struggle based on his humanity. So in verse 26... They sing a hymn. This is actually a reference to last week's discussion of the Passover meal. The actual end of a Passover meal is the drinking of the fourth cup. I don't know if you guys remember the cup of praise, the cup of Hillel. After everything's done, you drink the cup and then you go out. But what did Jesus say about drinking that last cup? He said, I'm not going to drink that cup until I come and drink it new in the kingdom. So he purposefully did not drink that final cup of praise, the cup of Hillel. Rather, they ended their time together with what comes just before the drinking of the fourth cup, which is a hymn. So they sing their hymn. We're seeing that the end of their Passover meal is happening, and they go out to the Mount of Olives. Now, we don't know what room that they were in. It takes a little while to walk across the city of Jerusalem. And it takes a little while to walk across the Kidron Valley and up onto the Mount of Olives. So let's say this is an hour after their meal. Which, do you remember what he told them at the meal? One of you is going to betray me. And an hour later, he tells them, you're all going to fall away. Is, is he referring to the betrayal? Can you get into the mind of, these, of the guys? Okay, a betrayal is coming, and now you tell us that we're going to fall away, and then to Peter specifically, you're going to deny me. I wonder if Peter was thinking, I am the one. Because they were asking, Lord, is it I? When they were around the table, and just an hour later, Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. 
I wonder if Peter's thinking I'm the one. But let's read it. Verse 27, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This, this idea comes in the book of Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Now, this section of Zechariah, it's in chapter 11 and following, is a, a return of the people of God to God. The, the Israelites, all, all the time, were constantly leaving God. They were worshiping all these other things. And Zechariah plays this weird part. He plays the picture of the bad shepherd. He gets hired to take care of the sheep of Israel. Now, illustratively, when, when the Bible's talking about the shepherd of the people, they're talking about like a pastor, I'm going to shepherd this flock. But for a picture, Zechariah actually gets hired to take care of actual sheep. And he has these two staffs. And he names one favor and he names one union. And he works for a couple of months and things are just going bad. All the other laborers hate him. He's mistreating everybody. And finally, he breaks favor. It's, it illustrates that the people, through their shepherds, have broken their covenant responsibilities to God, and so they've lost his favor. And so he says, all right, fine. I'm, I'm not going to work for you anymore. Just pay me my wages, whatever you want to pay me. And so how much do they pay him? 30 pieces of silver. And this bad shepherd, right? That's what Zechariah is being. He's being this bad shepherd. He is so fed up with this paltry payment, he throws the silver and where does he throw it? Right into the temple. You can have this garbage. Right? And so he breaks the other staff, union, showing the, the break between Israel and Judah, the two nations that make up the Israelite people. This bad shepherd was then replaced by a guy that's even worse. It's ugly, ugly, ugly. God was going to have judgment on that guy. A chapter later, we have this promise from God. I am going to send my shepherd. I'm going to send my shepherd, and he's going to lead the people. And, and you, you get to thinking, yeah, yeah, this good shepherd, everything's going to go great. He's going to care for the sheep, and he's going to bind up their wounds, and he's going to feed them, and they're going to be a bunch of fat sheep, full of fuzz, running around being awesome sheep. But you know what it says early on in the promise? I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter Two-thirds of the sheep are going to be lost. And I'm going to take a third of the sheep that are left over, and I'm going to try them in fire. And they will be purified. This promise is to purify the sheep. It's to take those who are left and who are God's actual people, and we're going to make them a pure people. We're going to make them right before God. And they are going to say, God is my God. And God is going to say, these are my people. What was the tool to make that happen in Zechariah's prophecy? The striking of the shepherd. So when he recites this, he, when Jesus recites this, he's telling them, you guys, this, this is the shepherd incident that Zechariah is talking about. It's going to be okay. But how are we going to get there? We're going to strike the shepherd. And the sheep are going to scatter. By the way, I don't know if anybody noticed, does Zechariah sound like another bad shepherd that was hanging out with Jesus for a while? You know, Judas was supposed to be a solid shepherd. And he ends up doing the things that Zechariah did. He loses favor. He breaks union. He, he resolves this wage and he throws it back uh, into the temple. And he is a rejected shepherd. How sad it is for Judas. And yet Christ is the good shepherd who's going to be struck and they are going to leave. Verse 28. After I'm raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. What a weird promise. Here we are in Jerusalem, the most important place in all of Israel. And when I die and I'm raised again, I'm going to go out into the scrub land. I'm going to go to the worthless place where we all came from. It's a little bit of an odd promise, and he's going to make the promise two more times by the time they actually find him in Galilee. 
But what we see in Jesus is he is not deterred by what's coming. When I'm raised, I am going to go before you. We see in Jesus great faith, knowing that God's plans are going to take place. And so verse 29, Peter said, even though they all fall away, I won't. What part of Peter is speaking there? Wisdom, strength. How about pride? How about arrogance? Jesus just told you you are going to fall away and you disagreed with him. Peter, what are you standing on? Well, we'll test you, Peter. Let's see how it works. Because we're going to see by the time this is done, Peter doesn't even need to wait for the rooster to start crowing. He's going to, he's going to fall asleep three times. That's pretty sad. Peter saying, I'm going to die for you. And Jesus said, no, you're not. So verse 32. The upcoming 10 verses carry a lot of connection to previous texts. When, when we read through it, we should be paying attention to, remember chapter 13, the apocalyptic story? Jesus said there's going to be an end, right? Remember how he wrapped up chapter 13? I, when, when a master leaves his home, he leaves the doorkeeper. You know what the doorkeeper's supposed to do? Which, it, by his name, it sounds like he's supposed to keep track of the door. Actually, a doorkeeper has one job. Stay awake. You know what happens when you sleep? Somebody comes into your room and steals all your stuff. Okay? So, how do you get away with that? Or away from that? You stay awake. So I tell you what I tell everyone else, stay awake. That, that was Jesus' end to chapter 13. No matter what is coming, you guys who are in charge of protecting the house of God, stay awake. What else do we have it tied back to? The idea of falling away. The idea of not having the strength. The idea that they, the, the disciples, they want to help Jesus, and yet they can't even stay awake. So let's read... Verse 32 went on. When they went to the place called Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. By the way, Gethsemane is a garden. We call it a garden on the Mount of Olives, which you guys ever understand mountains in Israel are like large hills. It's not like the Cascades or the Rockies. It's just a giant mound. And on that was an olive grove. Also next to it was a fig grove, probably there in an orchard. Sit here and pray. He has set his first watch. Verse 33, he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So he set his first watch, the guys at, at the edge of the vineyard. He goes in a little further and he sets his three best friends, Peter, James, and John. You guys stay here and pray. Protect me is what he's saying. Be watchful. Mind my situation because I'm struggling. And he goes further so it's just he and, he and the Father together. This part of the sermon is scary for me. You guys know why that is? Because the whole time, I'm right on the verge of speaking heresy. How, how troubled could Jesus possibly be? Did he lose faith? Was he fearful? Was he anxious? Did he not trust God? What, what's going on with Jesus? Why would he actually pray that God's plan would change? Is he rejecting God's plan? Well, no, but what is he doing? This is, a, <laughs> this is a dangerous place. I mean, the whole incarnation is confusing. How can God become a man? How can the all-knowing God learn something? How, how can the all-powerful God need something? He's asking his guys for help. How could he need any help? How could he receive any help? How do you help the all-powerful God? And yet we find in Jesus that he is truly human. So, which means at some point in time, between his birth and his death, he learned that he was Messiah. He learned that he is God. 
I don't know what that would be like. And when he learned that, he wasn't arrogant. If you learned that you were God, what would you do? Right? Everybody's had that dream. Would, would there be sin, sin involved somehow there? Well, yeah. And yet Jesus le learned that he is God? Is that even the right way to say that? I don't know. But Jesus in, is in a situation where he's going to cry out to the Father. Was he faking it? Oh, my guys are watching. I have to prove that I'm somehow human, so I'm just going to act like this is a big deal. You know, in John, a couple of times, I, I am praying to the Father not for my benefit, but for those who are listening. And then he goes go through this prayer. He, does, he did the thing that he did in John so that everyone else would see. Is that what he's doing here? He's going to act sorrowful so that everybody thinks he's a human. Well, you read it. It certainly doesn't read like that. It certainly looks like he is actually sorrowful unto death. He is actually troubled in his spirit. That he actually knows what's coming and is greatly distressed. This is serious. More than any other text in the whole scripture, we see Christ's humanity spelled out on the page. When, when Hebrews says that he experienced everything such as, as you and I, only without sin, um, I have never been this troubled. But no matter how much more troubled I can be, I know that Christ has experienced more. No matter how much suffering we go through, and there is bad suffering in this life, it's a taste of what Christ has endured. Just last week I talked to somebody who said, the, the rebuke and the disdain that they received seemed really bad until you realized it was just a taste of what Christ received. This was distressing, to say the least. Now, we do have a lesson to be learned in the way that Jesus prayed. Have you ever disagreed with God? Did, did it feel wrong to express that disagreement with God. I, I don't like the plan here, God. You know, because this, this seems somewhat flippant. God, I want the plan to change. Oh, but you can do whatever you want. We tend to go right to that promise uh, near, near the end of his prayer. Not my will, but what you will. That's the end of 36. And that's typically kind of where we race the subject. Jesus was begging God to change the plan. You ever beg God to change the plan? Did you know that that's okay? Did you know it's actually okay to tell God that you, you're not excited about the plan? Now, he eventually comes around and he sets his mind and his will to where you see at the end, my betrayer has come, it's time to do this. He does eventually come back to submitting to the Father's will and engaging in all that the Father had for him, but he had that time where he said, I don't like this. You are allowed to pray that prayer. That's called relationship. God wants a relationship with you. When he finally shows you what's coming in your life and you are worried, anxious, fearful, distressed, God sees that. He's not ignorant of your pain. He feels it with you. But he's also there to say, I'm with you through it, and so let's go. Right? There also has to be that time. If you're going to disagree with God, you have to have that time where you said, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm willing to go with this. That's a mini sermon on prayer. So what's he so worried about? Look, look at his prayer. Verse 35. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Hour, what's that? 36. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. The, the, the terminology that he's using is not, let's reject the plan. The terminology that he's using, the word possible, uh, the, the Greek term is 
options to achieve the same goal? Is it possible? Can we, is, is this one of those things like with Abraham? Abraham, I want you to go kill your son. And so they're going along with this plan, and yet we find that God provided this other option. Hey, there's a ram in the thicket. So here's Jesus going, is there a possibility that this could be another way? Right? We've seen it before. We're, we're, we're doing this thing, and yet there's this other possibility. Can we do it that way? His, his prayer is not throw out the plan. His, his prayer is, your plan. I want your plan. That's what he's praying for. So what is the, uh, the hour? What is the cup? And that's really the question of why Jesus' death on the cross has any value whatsoever. He knows what's coming. So what is coming? Now, the physical pain, suffering that he endured on the cross is excruciating. A lot of the medical studies that they've done over the years have shown there is not a lot of different ways you could die that would be worse than that. Horrific. And not to take away from how bad the physical was, the problem, the weight of what was coming for Christ was the fact that he was going to bear the sin of man and God was going to express his wrath against that sin. The cup that he had to drink was God's wrath. Do you remember we, a couple of months ago we talked about a cup? James and John, remember the question that they asked Jesus? When you come into your kingdom, can we have the seats of honor, the right seat and the left seat right by you in the kingdom? Can we have that? Remember Jesus' response? Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm going to be baptized? And, and, and there, the obvious answer was no. Well, what was in the cup? The suffering from the wrath of God. James and John, can you earn those places of honor? No, you cannot. But how did he wrap it up? He said, you will drink from a cup. You will taste from my cup. You will endure suffering. It's not going to be God's wrath, but it is going to be suffering. And so we talk about how a cup is, is like God's plan for your future. This is the road that you're going to walk, this cup. And drinking that cup is like walking that road. What was in Christ's cup? What was the road that he was going to take? What was the hour that was come upon him? The timing? What was God's plan for him? To take on the sins of the world and accept the wrath of God. Isaiah 52 and 53 uh, put it this way. It was the will of the Father or the will of God to crush him. Crush him. Some of those translations put it, it pleased God to crush him. Well, does that sound like a loving God? It doesn't sound like a loving God. We're going we're gonna to crush Jesus. It doesn't sound very loving you know, back about that time of the, of, of the sermon about the cup, we also brought up the big P word, propitiation. Anybody remember what propitiation means? It's this thing that's done to please the guy in charge. Exodus 34 is, is one of those. That doesn't sound right. Is it Numbers. Numbers uh, 24 is actually where it is. The, the people of God were wandering in the wilderness. And they were living next to the people of Peor. And they were worshiping their gods. And the way that you worship their gods is um, prostitution. And so God had called all the elders together. You guys, you guys pray that this stops. And while they were gathered together, a guy, it's one of the chief's sons... He takes one of these foreign women into his tent right there in front of everybody. And this woman was actually a princess. And so here he's a son of a chief and, and a princess. It's Romeo and Juliet. They're going to solve all the world's problems by just love. And uh, it angered God. And Phineas, who is the son of the high priest, he took a spear into that tent 
and in one motion put it through both of those people. You know what it said about that event? God said, because of Phineas's jealousy for my name, he took away my anger. It pleased me. That act propitiated the anger of God. The jealous desire to see the glory of God and his perfection and his holiness and his righteousness was expressed in a death. Okay, that's propitiation. Why is propitiation important? Because God is going to look on a people who have gathered together for themselves God's wrath and he's going to love them. How is he going to do that? Exodus 34 is where Moses is on the mountain and he's about to write down the Ten Commandments a second time because he broke the first set. And it said that the Lord passed before him. He, God was displaying his glory to Moses and he cries out to Moses, basically, I am God. I am the Lord. Right? And he, he talks about all the things that he is. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in mercy and, and grace and love and compassion to generation after generation. Right? He, he's going to forgive sin and he will by no means let the guilty go unpunished. He's going to forgive sin, but he's not going to let the guilty go unpunished. How do you do that? How, how do you punish guilt but forgive sin. Sin brings guilt. You should punish it, not forgive it. How do you do both at the same time? This God who is abounding in love and mercy, how does he forgive sin and punish guilt? You do it by propitiation. You see, Christ, who is the sinless man, stepped to the cross, and like Colossians said, the record of our sin debt was placed on him. And the wrath that, that God had for my sin was expressed on Jesus. The guilt was not left unpunished. It was fully punished on Christ. And he forgave me. How do you forgive sin and punish guilt? Propitiation. That's how you do it. That's what Christ did. He took the penalty, the punishment, the wrath of God so that God, who is abounding in mercy and overflowing in steadfast love, expresses forgiveness to me. That is a loving God. How is it that, a, a, that God can be loving by pouring out wrath on his son? That's actually the way he loves. And so here's Jesus going, let's find another way. I don't know if I can do this. This is a big deal. And his plan was to do this for a long time. Chapter 8, he's like, I have to go die. Again in chapter 9, I have to go die. Twice in chapter 10, I have to go die. See, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be delivered over into the hands of the, of the Jews and they're going to condemn him. And they're going to deliver him over into the hand of the Romans. And they're going to kill him. See, we are going to Jerusalem. And yet, we're, we're talking hours before his death. Twelve hours. He, his humanity shows through. In verse 36, he begins his prayer, Abba, Father. He, he comes to God... This God who has designed the effectiveness of propitiation. And he's coming to him as a loving father. Abba, father. It's this close, intimate, it's like a daddy type of a, of a thing. God, you love me. I love you. And then the next thing, all things are possible for you. He's acknowledging who God is in his nature and his character. Remove the cup from me. He's asking him to be merciful, which God is merciful. Isn't that a great prayer? You know, God said no. God said no. So Jesus said, all right, not what I will, but what you will. 
Now, when we look at Peter and the guys, Jesus keeps coming back. Did you stay awake? I'm struggling here. Did you stay awake? No, you're asleep. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's verse 38. I know you want to. I know you want to stand for me. Which, hello, midnight, they just had a huge meal. It's dark. Their eyelids are heavy. Have you ever tried staying awake then? I've talked to a few people who admitted, and they kind of feel bad about it. If I want to try to get to sleep, sometimes they pray. These guys are stuck here trying to pray and stay awake. Can, can you see where your flesh is going to make this into beddy time? We're not going to fault him in this, and yet Jesus is going, you said you would die for me. You can't stay awake. What do you expect your future to be like? Now, spoiler alert, they are going to be successful doorkeepers. Peter is going to stand for what is right. Peter is going to recognize falsehood when it comes, and he's going to protect the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Peter is going to do it. You want to know how? Because he's going to have the spirit of God in him. So this is eventually going to be okay for Peter, but we have this moment of seeing Peter and who he is and all that he presents. It's nothing. Peter is bringing nothing to the table to where by the time it's at the end, verse 41, he talked to him a third time. Do you know what three times is in, in Jewish mentality? If you see something once, it just happened. If you see something twice, that's pretty important. If you see something a third time, that's like rock solid. You rejected him to the highest level possible. By the time verse 41 comes along and says, that's enough. It's time to go be betrayed. Jesus has found himself alone. Not one person stood by him. Of all the people that he's helped, of all the people that he's healed, of all the people that he's taught and loved, he has no one by his side. What he went through for us is unexplainable. So verse 32, rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while they were still speaking, Judas, one of the 12. Anybody look up Psalm 41 or Psalm 55? This is not an enemy who betrays me. It's one who ate bread with me. We had sweet counsel together in the temple. That's what that Psalm says. This is a close friend. One of the 12 betrays him. And who does he bring with him? A mob with clubs and swords. Do you know what mobs with clubs and swords do? The word robber here is like they have found somebody. This guy has been robbing people out in the streets. He's been catching people on the highway and he's been beating them up and taking their stuff. And so we as a mob have nobly come together and captured the enemy. You come against me with swords and clubs? I was in the temple for a week teaching and you didn't arrest me there you know what he's pointing out their own hypocrisy you know what the bible says about the deeds done in the darkness their deeds of sin you come at me in the darkness with swords and clubs and you're standing for what's right huh right but he doesn't slow them down we have that statement right the scripture must be fulfilled what scripture there's a number of the Old Testament that's pointing at this idea that the shepherd is going to be struck. He's going to be betrayed. And then, man, you look at some of the more specific ones, Isaiah 52 and 53, it's going to get ugly. And it's going to get ugly fast. Do you see a change in Christ? Take this cup from me, and then the scriptures must be fulfilled. I don't want to do this. And he, without sin, he expresses that to the Father. And then he steals himself. We are going to go do this. It's like when he was in the wilderness, he set his face like flint for Jerusalem. See, we are going to Jerusalem. I am going to be betrayed. You are going to fall away. I am going to bear the wrath of God. The scriptures must be fulfilled. And so he goes. In verse 50, they all left him and fled. 
literally alone. And then, of course, 51 and 52 are an odd part of the story. I don't know if anybody noticed that. There's kind of this consensus. This is probably Mark, a very young man. He was hanging out with him that day. Why he went out in the garden wrapped in a linen cloth, I don't know. It could have been because of the foot washing ceremony that would have happened at the Last Supper. It could have been the, th the thing that a servant wears to feed the people of the Passover. Whatever it is, he didn't take the linen cloth home. So, runs away naked, whatever it is. He doesn't mention himself. Maybe he was embarrassed, whatever it is. Mark is written from Peter's perspective, right? Peter, the big hero, hacking ears off, though couldn't stay awake. Peter, what are you trying to do? You're going to save the day here at the very end? Too little, too late, brother. Okay? Are we told that was Peter? No. So we, we have some things left out, but guess what? Things have fallen apart. This is where the climbing, and it's climaxing, yay, it's exciting, and then we have this drop. It lets the air out of the balloon. We had a comment this morning about um, the, the presentation of the gospel to um, tribal people. Everybody remember the Basodio people? George and Harriet Walker and Bob. Bob and Noby Kennel. For some reason, that turned into noble in my mind. So Bob and George have been teaching through the Old Testament all the way up to the death and burial. And when they get to that point, which this took months, the people responded to that story like their life had ended. When was the last time you were listening to a story or watching a TV show and your life ended? And crying and weeping and sorrow. We have so many stories, we don't know what it means to listen to a story as though it was real. But they were listening to the story like, that's crazy. Our hero, Jesus, the one that we know is the one that we're supposed to be looking for, dies? They were totally distraught. Next morning, George gets up and he's going through his normal routine. He goes outside into the middle of the little village to wash his dishes and he realizes everyone's gone. <laughs> oh no, we chased them away. They all ran away. I've ruined everything. He was starting to get a little worried. So he continues washing his dishes and brushing his teeth, thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Went from the top of the hill, which is where all the, all the teaching happened. He hears a voice. George, what's taking you so long? You got to finish the story. They had all gotten up early before the sun came up and gotten themselves ready. And they were up ready to listen to the story. They were excited because there was a major problem. Their hero had died. To where when he tells the story of the resurrection... Their weeping was replaced with rejoicing. And they responded in celebration. When was the last time you heard the section of scripture read where he was resurrected and you cheered? Has anybody ever cheered? You throw, throw the book down and run around the house cheering. Anybody ever done that? We lack the ability here to celebrate. It's embarrassing how bad we are at celebrating. They knew how to respond to the story. As we see this story play out, this calls for weeping. This calls for remorse. It wasn't just him dying. It was Christ bearing the guilt that was mine. It, it, brings, it brings about worship that he would do that for me. As we wrap up the last couple of sessions in the book, I have one primary thing that I'm anticipating. A deeper appreciation of Jesus that leads us, or me, to worship. But I have a couple of questions. If I don't understand what Christ actually did on the cross, can I appreciate his work on the cross? If I don't appreciate his work on the cross, can I ever worship him? And the answer to those two is no. So as we anticipate a deeper worship of Christ our King, we are going to look at what he's actually doing on the cross. Because the primary purpose of the church is worship. 
It's the worship of our King Jesus. Because you look at all the other stuff that we tend to invest our lives in. The fluff of the world becomes remarkably unworthy of our praise. Our own actions are proven likewise. But not so the work of Jesus. Revelations 5.12 gives us a picture of what it's supposed to look like. John said, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the four living creatures, which were some sort of weird angel thingies, and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might, honor, glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits in the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That is what we are called to, brothers and sisters. The, the loud worship of Christ. He's great and greatly to be praised. And hallelujah, what a savior.